All right, so this recording will start at the uh, at this uh, next discussion. All right, so I will now share the uh, presentation which I started last week. So here is that uh, cyber training site. And here is here is the slide the slide deck from last week. Uh, can everybody see the slide deck? Yes. Okay. Now we did that slide and I, I skipped over this slide. I will go back to it now. So this slide is um, illustrative of, I, I, I was trying to think what you're meant to learn from all of this. So I, maybe I'll just say that first because that sort of brings us up to, up to date. So we have this clouds, which we will discuss in detail a little longer. That's where everything is implemented. There is the edge which is the other place things are implemented. And this particular GE thing has both the edge and the cloud. The edge actually are the aircraft engines and the cloud is the cloud. Um, then there are two things you need to know. One is you have to, we are being uh, digitized. So there's one trend which is um, becoming digital. So that's sort of illustrated by, let's take the example of health and medicine electronic health records. That says we're digitizing all those things that used to be written on paper. Another thing in that thing, there's something called digital therapeutics. So that is the digitization of the therapeutics industry. And there are lots of startups in the area of digital therapeutics. Then we have the actual big data de that is associated with the big data deluge, though it's logically distinct. The fact that we're making everything digital is inclined to create a big data deluge. So they're sort of obviously related. And uh, we need to know about that. And we gave lots of examples last time. And the other thing that um, big data comes with is looking at the big data. And looking at the big data has two components. One is the uh, the way that we make progress. Namely, in the past, we tended to make hypotheses or theories, and the data inform those theories. Now the data is so rich and the analysis methods are so sophisticated, we can often make progress with data on its own. And the example I gave yet again, I will give again, is the example of recommender engines where there is no theory, I think, of a recommender engine, but the data tells you what you might want to, what product you might want to buy, or what video you might want to watch. So that's an example of the uh, fourth paradigm. Data, where the member of the paradigms were theory, experiment, computational, that's large scale simulation, and, and data driven. And data driven says the data drives the analysis. And all right, so those, and you as, and as you move into the future, you will undoubtedly be involved in both the digitization, the big data, and doing things with the big data where you will not always, but often you will see the data-driven analysis approach. And in the data-driven analysis, we are getting far more sophisticated with, as I mentioned, uh, deep learning replacing most of the previous methods. Although that replacement is very asymmetric. I mean, in some fields like uh, natural language processing and image processing, it is sort of dominant. In other areas, it is only just starting to happen. But if you went, if, I think if you did, if you met anybody looking at the area, the self-driving cars or anybody looking at uh, pathology images, they're always going to be using deep learning for image processing. If you go to Google Assistant or Alexa or Cortana, uh, whatever the Microsoft one is called, you will always be looking at deep learning for 
audio audio recognition or interpretation or if you go to google tra a translation web page that translation is always done by deep learning so some areas are totally dominant other areas like um well even the discovery of the higgs boson uh, which is um, a scientific mega achievement there there you there is little they have started to use deep learning, but it is only as modest uh, activity. And actually, I think in this example here, this for example here was comes from 2012, at least the description does. I think it's, it's obviously, apart from the reduction of air travel due to the pandemic, it's still ongoing. Um, they were not using deep learning. They were using classic machine learning to look for anomalies in the sensors, they, they record the sensor data from the engines. Those sensor data are transmitted uh, over the same link that you use for um, presumably internet transmission from the aircraft when you do uh, internet work on the aircraft. And then that gets stored in the cloud. And that cloud would use in, um, probably would uh, look at um, most, probably importantly for anomalies because you want to see whether there's any problems. So, all right, so this is just this talk, this fellow Ru, who surprisingly is still, I think, in roughly the same position, at least he was a little while ago. Um, and he pointed out that the Twitter was, um, in 2012, was actually producing less data than General Electric. I imagine that may not be true today because Twitter's probably gone up and GE is, well, today is pretty small, but GE, if we remove the pandemic, has probably not come up dramatically. Um, and the this actually is a pretty interesting example of digitization, if you look at the GE case, because I'm sure those sensors always were were always were on um, engines. However, in the previously before this um, edge to cloud. Um, digitization happened, those sensors were looked at whenever the, your aircraft taxi to the, uh, to the, to the, um, to the start, uh, stop, the mechanics would go and look at the sensors uh, and see if there were any problems. What's happened in this digital world is that now those sensors are in real time transmitting the data to the, um, to the cloud so that uh, as, uh, they can actually be analyzed before the aircraft even arrives at the gate. So that's an example of, well, it's not exactly digitization, but it's certainly an improved real-time use of digital data when it's available. And I gave other examples last time. If you look at this, this, these types of analyses, some are batch-oriented, and some are real time. Interpreting language is real time. I say interpreting these aircraft engine is real time. Um, but there are a lot of important applications where you're, I don't know, you're doing a study of, of um, what effects are important for say COVID spread, for the uh, COVID being particularly dangerous. That is not being done in real time. That data comes out in chunks it gets accumulated in databases that get bigger and bigger. And you, you run your favorite analysis, which nowadays would probably be deep learning, uh, every now and then. So that's, um, so, but real time and what you might call batched are both important usage models. And this is just some further detail of this uh, GE case. And uh, I think in my, online lectures, I point out that this is an example which is of growing importance, which is the intelligent machine. That all machines are going to live on the internet. Oh, sorry, they're going to be connected to the internet. And um, they will, by being connected to the internet, they can do what this GE engine is, tell tell the backend host what's going on in the, wherever the engine is. They can also receive instructions. If they're a printer, they can do some printing. And if, if they were some sort of on-demand 3D um, 
printer of uh, spare parts, they would automatically make whatever was um, needed, plunk it on a conveyor belt and send it off to, uh, to the uh, digitized delivery system. So intelligent online machines are an inevitable consequence of the world we live in. And I pointed out that this is called the industrial internet of things because it's these machines are typically from industry and it is a huge emphasis actually on General Electric. It has a big, a big effort in the industrial in, in building software and for the industrial internet of things and putting taking their air conditioners and refrigerators and jet engines and uh, hooking them up to be intelligent machines on the internet. All right, so now we come to computing trends. Uh, this one is, um, this one actually tells you what happened in 2008. Two, though this was not, didn't actually happen in 2008, it was sort of its impact was most clear around 2008 when Intel effectively announced it could no longer trivially increase the performance of, of computers and that uh, and the reason was simple due to the amount of power needed to, needed to drive them and so it effectively did not increase the frequency of the chip. I mean, well, uh, in general, what's happening is the feature size is getting smaller and smaller. Well, feature is distance. At reasonable size distances, the, uh, if you decrease the distance by a factor of two, you halve the time, and so you can increase the clock speed. In the, but now they can't do that any longer because the power needed to drive this will become too big. So what happened is they used to be scaling in three dimensions, X and Y, that's the size of the chip, and in time. Now they're only scaling in, um, in space and not in time. And they're using that scaling in space to make lots and lots of um, cores, which uh, now are up to, I don't know, up to maybe 50 cores in the most leading edge uh, general purpose chip. In other chips, they're much more than 50 cores. And you run those cores independently and increase the power by doing multiple computations simultaneously. All right, and so here we have, um, I pointed out that you can't get, uh, unfortunately, um, good graphs updated very often these days. Here is the uh, increase in power of computers on the left, and here's the increase in capacity <coughs> of hard drives on the right. And on the right is expressed in price per gigabyte <coughs> or capacity. On the left, it's, in, it's expressed in performance for $1,000. You have to fix something. In some sense, you can fix the size. For $1,000, you get a, effectively a certain size of a, you can build a certain volume of computing. And the same for the hard disk. For a certain amount of money, you build a certain volume. Now here's another version of that graph, which I copied from Wikipedia, which is the uh, cost to make a, a gigaflop. Um, a gigaflop is 10 to the ninth floating point operations per second. And if you wanted to do that in 1961, it will cost you $150 billion. If you want to do it in 2017, it would cost you $0.03. Cents. So these uh, dramatic decrease in price is the, uh, it's been driving the use of computers, which is driving the um, processing of the big data. So I unfortunately actually use these machines, the 7030 and the, which was the high-end IBM machine at the time. There were other IBM machines, which IBM was actually in the leading edge in those days in terms of the computers. And then Seymour Cray uh, had a whole set of supercomputers of which the Cray XMP was one of the most successful. All right, so here's another plot of storage cost declining. This is again only up to 2013. You will actually see this issue that things, um, 
sort of stop getting updated and if they were too basic in the next lectures on use cases. There is no recent general use case study that I'm aware of. So the use case study comes from 2015. So if you look at those slides, you'll find the methods, some of the methods they just discussed there are actually out of date. However, the use cases are not out of date. They're the same use cases people are doing today. So those slides still have value. Anyway, here is a, another plot of the storage decreasing and the bandwidth, which is not decreasing quite as much. It's uh, the cost per uh, thousand uh, megabits per second. I actually stopped with, I jumped ahead last time to this one because it has this interesting um, plot of the computing needs of deep learning compared to the increase of the uh, Moore's law, which is the increase in the hardware performance. Now, they're, they're probably the overall is these are all relative. So <coughs> we can still actually run deep learning on the hardware. It just needs more hardware. And we used to, used to I mean, running deep learning back in 1990 when there was not much data and the algorithms was not very sophisticated, didn't take much time at all. A frac a negligible part of the world's computing. Now I would say deep learning is a non-trivial part of the world's computing. And you can see it's actually increased by two, four, six. It's increased by 10 orders of magnitude um, compared to the actual, to Moore's law. So that's reasonably impressive. No, it's increased by 10 orders of magnitude in 1985 and Moore's law has gone up by maybe five orders of magnitude. So there's a big discrepancy. And probably, it's, I think at the moment, deep learning is still accommodate. I mean, I don't think Google and Facebook and Microsoft are unable to run the deep learning they want to do. We are, we can't run the deep learning we want to do. Uh, but the main companies where, which have the most intensive algorithms and they can still, I think, but I think it's getting to the stage where it's a little worrisome that they may need to work rather than getting better algorithms, work more on getting algorithms that run quicker. They already do algorithms running quicker for the edge. If you look at this world with an edge and a central data, uh, data center, the, um, amount of computing at the edge is much smaller than the data center. We just give a, I mean, an example. I told you there were 50 million computers in the cloud, the plus or minus factors of two. Well, if I go to my, even the pretty large edge, the, uh, um, my self-driving car, it will have maybe one GPU in it from NVIDIA. So that's a huge, that's a huge reduction. And so that means that um, when I'm doing self-driving cars, I must only use algorithms on the edge, which can be run effectively on a single GPU. And so there is a lot of effort in, in making actually the algorithms, customize the algorithms to, um, to run fast on the edge. Now, actually it's not, there is one usage issue which makes it easier than you might hope, Namely, um, when I'm doing deep learning, I have to do two things. I have to train the model. We might have, well, for a complex image, could have a billion parameter model. So we have to find those billion parameters, the weights of the network. Um, that we will always do on the cloud because to train the network requires um, huge amounts of data. So on the, whereas on the edge, we're using so-called inference. We're taking the model that's already been trained and we're running it on the edge for the new input. And so we feed the input in and ask what the model thinks it's, that, it, that it means. There is some training actually still done in the speech case on the edge because if they want to, if they want to have a very effective edge device, if somebody new comes along, they want to do so-called transfer learning, to learn the special features of that person. That could possibly be done on the edge. All right, uh, so here is um, this model of an intelligent edge and an intelligent cloud. 
which uh, IBM called the uh, global uh, supercomputer, and I added the AI supercomputer, I added the word modeling in there, because at least academically, you do lots of simulations on the, on the central data center. And this particular slide has this important um, feature of stressing that the edge and the cloud are sort of equally important. There's actually, I, there's actually more data stored at the edge than the cloud, a factor of four, I think, on the edge compared to the cloud in some estimates. <coughs> and you can see what the edge does. It makes inference. I already mentioned that. It takes action. If that uh, edge is inside your self-driving car, you will adjust the motion of that car. And so they're limited processing, but it has a huge advantage of low latency. If you want an answer in say less than, let's say a fifth, if, you want, if it's less than a fifth of a second, you better do it on the edge. If you want the answer in a second or more, you can do it in the cloud. The cloud can respond in substantially less than a second. Um, anyway, so the edge is for low latency and it's um, not totally secure, but because the information is isolated, it has some security, natural security. The cloud, on the other hand, is where we aggregate the data. We do, as I said, the training. We have lots of computing and um, it's not terribly trusted because everything is mixed together. And uh, here points out the Intel, which I actually mentioned more positively recently in terms of their, break, their, their innovations in multi-core uh, chips. Uh, they were unable to do the next step of making seven nanometer. The, reduce, the feature size is reduced to uh, seven nanometers. And whereas IBM and TSMC uh, are able to make seven nanometer chips. And um, my, a lot of my friends work at the Argonne National Lab, a big DOE lab and near Chicago. And uh, they have a big machine, $500 million supercomputer called Aurora, which is using Intel chips. And um, it was meant to be the first machine to reach the so-called exascale uh, computational threshold. Um, we go, um, exascale is 10 to the 18th operations per second or 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. And um, there is some pseudo competition. I mean, it's not a real competition because your machines are gradually increasing in power, hitting a particular level first is nothing special if you get leapfrogged a few months later by somebody else, but it's psychologically important. And uh, Aurora was hoping to be the first of these machines. Um, and I forgot to mention Samsung, which is also delivering seven nanometer devices. Um, all right, so that just tells you that uh, this field is still, even this you know, pretty traditional thing, trying to reduce the feature size has been going on for a long time, uh, but it's not true. It's getting pretty non-trivial because you're reaching the limits of device science device physics. And uh, this slide here tells you that NVIDIA is doing better than Intel. <coughs> it, it doesn't, uh, NVIDIA doesn't uh, do build chips. It uh, makes chips using other people's foundries, which they can now use TSMC if they wanted to. Uh, and they, they have, they've been hugely successful because the chips they used to build for graphics, which were dominated by gaming, then by making bitcoins, and now they're dominated by doing deep learning. Because deep learning, uh, if you look at the sort of theory, the operations of computing, um, it was discovered that the, not, well, it's not terribly difficult, it's, it's, it's an expected discovery that GPUs are very effective when you have a lot of rep repetitive computation because GPUs are designed to process pixels and they have a lot of technology in them which do the same thing in parallel together. And that's exactly what you need to do. So that, that's because you have lots of pixels which need to be processed simultaneously. 
in graphics, but that same simultaneous processing can be used from say matrix, matrix multiplication and deep learning is dominated by matrix multiplication. And Bitcoin also has these repetitive computations in it. So GPUs have for some time been the system of choice for the highest end uh, computations. And there's, there's actually some competition. Uh, Intel now has its own GPU. AMD makes a GPU. But NVIDIA is still the leader in this field. And so there, if you look at this, um, this plot here, the blue is the data center revenue, which is GPUs and data centers. And you can see a huge jump in the, the last quarter, <coughs> March, through, March through June. And uh, actually, the, it's, this is still less than half NVIDIA's income, uh, but gaming is actually only a fraction of that uh, um, $2 billion uh, quarterly uh, non data center activity. And actually, um, data center is above gaming now for, for NVIDIA. And NVIDIA just has a new uh, GPU A100, which is uh, particularly powerful. They are, all these people introduce more and more powerful systems. With, and they try to find names for them. Um, so now we come to science. Now, if probably if you're getting a job in the real world, you're not so interested in science. So for, for people like me who work in academia, we do a lot of effort analyzing scientific data because Google doesn't analyze scientific data. And so we have, um, we have a, when needed and have the field to us, uh, field uh, to ourselves. Whereas if you work, say, in natural language processing or recommender engines, then there's a huge effort from Facebook, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, in those areas. And um, the, the computing systems which support science are called, by definition, called cyber infrastructure. <coughs> this is a term invented by NSF. And it just, uh, there is, as far as I know, cyber infrastructure is the same as what's used commercially. It just has a different name. Uh, but it's a nice name, it's cyber and it's infrastructure. So this is the electronic infrastructure, hardware, software, potentially algorithms that supports um, uh, research. And they say there is, it's logically the same as the hardware, software, and algorithms that support uh, industry jobs, industry activities, except there is, of course, a somewhat difference because we have different demands. Industry is dominated by, by a set of applications, and those applications are not the same as you need in science to analyze physics data, astronomy data, biology data, or it's not the same as you need in, in, me in medicine to, to enhance for digital health. Um, so anyway, there's something called E more or less anything or which, because you can put E in front of everything. There's obviously e-business, the e-commerce has a lot of um, discussion as, as, as the pandemic has enhanced e-commerce. It's now jumped to about, it jumped by about 4% of the total um, th th just the last of three months. So e-commerce is, is certainly rapidly increasing. But uh, and again, for research, we talk about e-science. Um, and then there's this example here from um, the CERN laboratory, which describes the discovery of the Higgs boson. There was a whole unit on the discovery of Higgs boson, so that's why I put it here. And you see on the top left, sorry, top right, you will see that um, even though the Higgs boson is really small, it requires a giant apparatus. This round thing here is the Atlas uh, detector. It's living inside a, um, the accelerator. Its Atlas is over here. The rings cross every now and then, and where they cross is another one. CMS is actually similar to Atlas. And the rings cross here. They cross here at HCB, and they cross over here at Alice. So these are the uh, 
one, two, three, four major experiments in the LHC. But ATLAS and CMS are the two largest, and they're actually very similar, and they're deliberately very similar because um, if you're discovering something really new, you better be sure it's correct because it's so easy to make a mistake. And so you one simple way of doing that is just to do two of everything so that you do two separate analyses. <clears throat> and if they give the same sort of answer, then, well, that's uh, pretty um, likely that it's right. And uh, there's around 100 petabytes per year coming from this um, accelerator, at least when it's operational, it's closed down at the moment. And uh, the, this, these are old slides, it says 50 here, I think it's now 100. And it requires, well, again, this was a few years ago, 2017, I think it said 200,000 cores, computer cores were used to analyze data from, um, from this collider. So that's probably gone up by now. And then what is the data analyzed? It's like this. This is the depiction of two protons colliding. And uh, when they collide, hundreds of other, well, at least often hundreds of other particles are produced. These particles are protons, neutrons, bions, muons, electrons, photons. And then these giant apparatus up here detect the particles. And uh, this picture here, these blue things are just the parts of the detector that are flagged in activity. And then there's actually, so I used to write this software which analyzed such events, not for the LHC, for earlier exper early accelerators, because I did experimental particle physics for some time. And this is, you know, what you might call the beginning of um, machine learning. We used to write very sophisticated algorithms that took these blue signals and converted them into physics, where the physics would be that this is a pi meson of a ch positive charge and a momentum of 10 GeV or whatever the parameters were. And you, and you need to say, find the momentum, the charge, the particle type, and uh, putting all that together, you can re look at the event and see if there was a Higgs boson. This is a Higgs boson, and what's really surprising of this event, which is what, why it was looked at, is that there's a huge amount of activity coming. Here's the protons colliding. They're coming up and down this line here. There's a huge amount of energy going off in this direction. That's called large transverse momentum because it's transverse to the direction of motion of the two protons. And it's very rare to get large transverse momentum and things fall off very fast in transverse momentum. And uh, however, if you take something like a Higgs boson, which is a giant heavy object, it will uh, produce large transverse momentum. So this is a Higgs boson event. All right. And that, of course, is discovery of the Higgs boson is important because it underlies the fundamental theory of the, of the particles that make us. And here is the, um, you looked at those events uh, and then you plot, and this is the, you look at not particular event, you look at events where there are two photons. Those photons produce giant shards. You measure the energy of the shards. And then given the, given the energy and direction, which is the momentum, you get the momentum and you calculate the mass for, by adding these two photons together. <clears throat> and that mass has a bump, which is shown here better by subtracting this background. This is all really old fashioned machine learning, if you like, and it's not deep learning. And <clears throat> that was the earliest discovery of the Higgs. Now the Higgs is much better established with much sharper bumps. Uh, the width of this bump just reflects the measurement resolution of the device. Here is actually a picture from um, uh, Brookhaven of an accelerator. Uh, this is the RIC, relativistic uh, accelerator, high, heavy ion accelerator. Here is another big science, which has huge amounts of data. Everybody is preparing for the square kilometer array, which is shown here, which should come online maybe four years from now, something like that. It is a giant radio telescope, and it will produce much more data than the Large Hadron Collider. At the moment, 
astronomy does not have as much data as the larger. It has a lot of data, but not as much as the LHC. And uh, the types of things you can do in astronomy is study, you study the universe at different wavelengths, that's called multi wavelength astronomy, and you see effects like this of region of sky observed in uh, different wavelengths. Here's one uh, that I used to do, I no longer do, it's because the project finished. It's hard to get funding to do things for more than a few years. This is work with Kansas on uh, analysis of data from radars here. We have a uh, uh, we have radar devices in these vehicles, like here, this is a radar device. It sends the signals down into the, into the ice. They, it bounces off the, um, the bedrock below, below the glaciers, and then you, by looking at the structure of the reflections of the bedrock, you can disentangle where the bedrock is, and which is a couple of kilometers down, I believe, from what I, in many, most cases. And, but you can then map out the bottom of the glaciers and explain and understand how they're going to move with time and melt. So that's all to do with climate change. And all of this data does not actually come back by satellite is actually written to disk because the volume of data is too much to send back by satellite. Uh, here we have a plot of the human genome and it shows that the uh, Genome is uh, just like deep learning went up in um, volume needed and computing needed compared to Moore's law. Here we have poor old Moore's law describing the computing behavior. And here we have the cost per genome is going down much faster. It's sort of leveled off in 2015. And that implies again that the importance of computing in biology of uh, genomics has increased because you can now, for a given amount of money, produce three orders of magnitude, well, let's say two orders of magnitude, of one of, you know, we're, we're two orders of magnitude better than Moore's law. So we need a hundred times the computing we used to use just because you have compared to the Moore's law a hundred times the data. And uh, so again, I pointed out how the stretch went from $150 billion for a gigaflop down to three cents. Now here we have, it's going from a, a billion dollars for the first genome in 2001 to $1,000 for a state, for a, for a full genome analysis today. This points out something which is true about the world. Namely, when I looked at the LHC and um, astronomy, that's big, so-called big science. Single large experiment. And, uh, and uh, like on the uh, things like ATLAS and CMS, they might, might have three to 5,000 scientists on the experiment and 200 institutions. You just, if you, uh, whereas, um, there's also the law, the, there's also individual scientists working loosely coupled in the community, but a given experiment of gathering data can well be involved just a single scientist. So that's the so-called long tail. And the long tail has significant data meant to be around a petabyte per year, uh, but it's not done by one giant group like the Atlas, which is a few petabytes, maybe it's uh, 20 petabytes per year from a single experiment. This is lots of data, but produced by summing up lots of people producing modest amounts of data. Uh, and this, this idea of the long tail is actually important in the digital world because it's now, e when you were in the past, like uh, the best example is books. If you went to a bookstore, that bookstore could not stock uncommon books. But Amazon can stock on common books because stocking for them is just a bit of text. And with a good recommender engine, they can actually locate those uh, unusual things. So the long tail has some advantage, has, has actually quite well served by this digital world because it becomes practical to address the long tail, uh, which, uh, whereas it's not practical in the old world.
Well, not in the real world, just because a bookstore can't have enough, enough shelves. All right. Here's a little, let's skip over this one. It's just a list of activities. We've already mentioned most of these. Here is an interesting comment from Wad, and it uh, comes from this magic year around 2008 when all these changes happened. That's when the, these revolutions became clear to people. Um, and here, this, this is the, um, just a minute. Sorry about that, I'm back. All right, so we have the four paradigms of scientific research. Um, theory, experiment, what's called computational science, that's number three, and data science, number four. And data science is roughly the same as data intensive scientific discovery. Computational science is roughly the same as simulation. Uh, now, it, Experiment or observation is, is um, they actually should go together. Number one goes with number three, because the simulation is usually the simulation of a theory. Number two goes with number four. <coughs> the difference between two and four is that the data-driven one has so much data, the data tells you the answer. Because when Newton sat down on a, with his notebook and observed apples falling from the tree, he did not feed that data into a deep learning network to get the answer. He, he actually looked at the answers, noted the patterns himself, and deduced Newton's law. So, but nowadays, uh, you could imagine a deep learning network discovering Newton's law. I've right? done work in that general area. And uh, here is this uh, plot which I've shown for a million years from this happy looking person who um, tells this story in the class from either Stanford or Berkeley, how they had a competition and the competition, the students who uh, used a rather crummy theory, crummy model with huge amounts of data did better than the students who did a wonderful model with a small amount of data. And uh, that's, of course, illustrative of the importance of the big data, data-driven approach. All right, so now we have a bit of comments on systems. And um, systems have, there was actually a lot of debate in the world about clouds and supercomputers and whether they're the same. Is the IU facility a cloud or a supercomputer and what? Should you use Amazon or IU? And uh, they're actually all just data centers. So I actually like to think about everything as the same as a data center. It's a, each data center is a bag of computers, which those computers have networks. And those computers are either simple computers or complex computers. 10 years ago in 2010, it was rather cleaner because public clouds were all simple computers. They didn't have, NVIDIA equipped um, nodes and things like that. They just had very simple, cheap computers, just full of them, because they were mainly aimed at analyzing search and things from the web or supporting the early social media. That was not compute intensive, it was all data intensive. So they really did not need sophisticated computers and lots of cores, they needed lots of disks and fast access to the data. Um, and, but now it's changed because we now have this very sophisticated machine learning that starts taking a lot of computer time. And so um, we're in the public clouds are now actually pretty similar to supercomputers. They still have what you might call the commodity parts, but they have parts of it which are quite like supercomputers. Another important um, Develop, with recent um, obvious development is the Apache Software Foundation and the hundreds of software packages available from that. Um, I'm pretty certain that as we move on, all of these ideas, high performance computing, which is really supercomputers, will have to get merged with the public clouds and the 
Apache software because we, the, everybody needs the same thing. They want to take their data and process it as fast as possible. So you might as well use the best, the fastest possible hardware and algorithms. Well, here is just a very recent plot of um, the status of clouds. And uh, this number here is the interesting number, $35 billion or 34.6 was the amount of money spent by industry or commercial or enterprises on clouds. So that's um, whatever, $140 billion a year on cloud infrastructure services. And that is increased 10% over the previous quarter. And I mentioned earlier that in around now, 90 to 95% of all computing is done on clouds. If you look at the clouds, the uh, Amazon, Amazon in 2008 came out with the first cloud. I told you 2008 was an important time. It was where a lot of these ideas, you now are driving everything forward, came forward. We had the multi-core chips, the clouds, and that was also the beginning of when deep learning started to really started to exist. It wasn't until the so-called AlexNet around 2014 that its success was obvious, but it was started around 2008 is when people started to try to do these classic big data deep learning computations. Anyway, if we now look at um, the current share, it's uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, and then Google. Google for a long time insisted that clouds were not important and they had their own version of a cloud, which was actually quite effective, but very specialized. And now they've adopted the same general cloud as everybody else. And so you have Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, but there's still the rest. You want 37% others, that's IBM, Oracle, Tencent, and all the other vendors, plenty of vendors. So one thing I want, and actually this is a slide from the past. I sort of, I remember I taught this the first lecture, first course I gave at IU in 2001, DIKW. And what, well, this is important to know, remember, because you take data, that becomes information, inform when it's all cleaned up, you take the information, you hand it to a deep network, it becomes knowledge, then that knowledge gets assimilated and processed and becomes either wisdom, then you have some sort of pervasive community knowledge, or decisions. Let's do such and such. And, um, it's worth noting that this step here, which is rather, um, it's, it's always happens, it actually takes a lot of the effort. It may not take a lot of the computing power, but all of this uh, step from data to information and packaging the information to allow the networks to, use, to be trained on it, that's data engineering, which is a dominant feature of what we need, I want to do. And, um, the amount of megabytes, or I should say, exabytes decreases as you go from data to wisdom. Wisdom can just be yes, very short, but the data could be, um, well, we've seen, could be hundreds of petabytes from the LHC. Here is an example of um, sort of trying to illustrate that we have all this uh, stuff, these things on the edge, could be small things like smartphones, but they can be GE uh, aircraft. They can, these are geophysical sensors, water sensors. Um, these are the uh, uh, genomic sequences from, uh, and uh, they can also be just other, sort of other computers. They can be satellites. They can be sitting in databases. Here's an LHC experiment. Here's a webcam, here's a uh, telescope. So all of these edge devices pour in data. These data go through uh, uh, sort of exchange services, which, are, which of this is, is data to information services. Then they get run through filters and aggregated and discovered. 
and then here we have the executive or, or president or just your student uh, doing their research or study which make decisions. So this is a uh, sort of view of how the uh, data information, knowledge, wisdom, decision deluge happens. Here is a trivial example from Google Maps. So the data is the original maps or those overlays they provide. The information is the web, Google Maps web page, which has it all processed and <coughs> simulated. <coughs> the knowledge is the particular route from place A to place B. And the decision is um, the wisdom comes from deciding to drive a particular route. So anyway, you can give other examples. This is just one simple example. Well, here is just again another comment on parallel computing and the difference between HPC and clouds. There is something important called a MapReduce, which is an important uh, uh, approach to processing data. It says a lot of data processing consists of maps which are computing tasks on data, followed by reductions, which are a similar, which are joining together the results of the maps. And although uh, they're, they're not always quite as simple as that, but uh, effectively all computing can be thought of like that. And every now and then there are cases which are map only, I mean, you don't even have to do the reduction. If, um, uh, if you're just saying, if you have, let's say Fitbit, Fitbit's a, is a Fitbit. It's sending data to the cloud and it's just storing it. So it's actually a map only thing. The only thing happened is every Fitbit does its stuff independently. And um, there are lots of Fitbits, but then, and then I compare that with, say, the big computations done by the Department of Energy to study new batteries. There you might have a hundred a million cores running on the same job. The Fitbit has maybe a million cores running on a million people. Um, and, but there's, that's the other, another variant of that is a million cores on the same job. That's because a battery is a very complex system and to simulate a battery requires a lot of independent computations linked together by the fact that you're, you have a material which you're studying. And uh, all of these will merge, in my opinion, to a, what you can call a high performance or supercomputer cloud. We saw that with Microsoft's picture. And here is a picture of MapReduce showing these um, independent green computers, data coming off disks, coming from instruments. And uh, the maps are done, the green independent computations. Then they do a reduction. Then they might do another map another reduction and so on. And then the result comes to the decision maker. But all the parallelism is data oriented and that's a very general feature. These green arrows here are coming from individual disks, if you like, on these different computers. Uh, well, we have this um, thing which I stressed in the spring class of uh, of transformation. I asked you also to discuss that in the first homework. And um, the key thing, I've, as I've mentioned so often, is that deep learning and AI is behind a lot of these trends. That these transformations have, have two things driving the digital transformation and the deep learning or AI transformation. One follows from the other. You can't really do it without the digital transformation. But often now they're not really distinguished because when you have the digital transformation, you automatically do the AI. And sometimes you just only need the digital transformation. Uh, like <coughs> but um, th these combination of digitization and digital processes combined with AI is driving all these into transformation of industries. And uh, that transformation can be thought of as technologies, old industries, and new industries. And if you want to participate then you better know about cloud computing where the work is done and deep learning, which is how the work is done. 
So here is a list of core technologies, which are actually typically implemented by companies or organizations. Here we have some new industries, the internet, the collaboration industry like Zoom, the search, Google, cybersecurity, smart homes and offices, and cities and robotics. And here we have <coughs> traditional industries transformed. Um, the ones we are mentioning are transportation. So transportation has obviously been transformed with ride hailing and electric cars. Uh, electric cars are an illustration is actually electric cars have a huge software and AI component, but also they have a technology component of new materials and new sources of power. We know how commerce and e-commerce are being revolutionized. Well, commerce has been revolutionized e-commerce. We now discuss smart machines. Another issue is um, digital twins making models of everything. Agriculture and food is being revolutionized by drones over overflying uh, fields and finding out where there's drought and things like that. We know the travel industry has huge impact from these with Airbnb and and uh, better online models for, for deciding on your travel. Banking has huge um, has a huge effort called fintech, which is fintech, financial technology, which has a huge investment. And um, health has we also can discuss, which is got a lot of deep learning, such as for pathology or personalized genomics. And there's also things like remote surgery, where the AI guys, uh, a robotic uh, surgeon, making, uh, doing an operation on you. Energy has a lot of impact from both, say, intelligence, which is, again, software for the electrical grid, as well as some material things like solar, <coughs> solar and wind power. In general, science is, get, has huge impact from analyzing the data with new algorithms. Sports has a huge impact. I have a, some, a module on that uh, where we can um, analyze everything from the statistics of baseball games, as sabermetrics, to the look, using video to analyze the, uh, uh, the, I don't know, the swing of a tennis bat racket or a golf golf club and uh, identify what the uh, sports person is doing wrong. We know there's a lot of developments, especially digitize, more digitization in the entertainment and gaming area. The recommender entrants are a good example of deep learning in that area. And of course, there's huge amounts of news, fake news, education, and the jobs associated with all of these things. Here is a little picture of um, finding out that um, things always do change. Here is the change of commerce from um, general stores up to uh, through various manifestations to e-commerce. Um, here is a sad consequence of progress, uh, an abandoned mal. And here is, I used to ask students in my classes whether there were males would survive. And at least in 2014, there were still people like me who thought they might not survive. And here is some plot of, uh, of um, red is stores closed, blue is stores opened. And um, from 2017 through 2019, uh, they are, uh, more, more, um, more closed than opened. And there is over here, we have famous stores, which have shut a lot of, um, a lot of um, store companies have shut a lot of stores. And um, this comment here is um, important to understand and why you get the job you do is because the reason why uh, there are so much progress in these areas is that all these areas like e-commerce or YouTube watching 
or social media, they have, they have, they have a scale equal to 7 billion, another number of people in the, in the country, in the, in the world. And so now you're looking at AI and cloud computing as being the drivers of the 7 billion people's activities. And so suddenly the investment in the AI and the investment in clouds scales with the number of people. So it's enormous. When I used to work on the new ways of doing parallel computing and um, 40 years ago, yeah, 40 years ago, um, that didn't really impact 7 billion people or whatever, whatever the population of the world, the world was then. It just impacted a few high-end researchers doing difficult problems. So it was very important to them but it didn't have a scanning factor of 7 billion. They had a scanning factor of 1,000 or something, whatever the number of um, high-end users was. And now that number of 1,000 actually has kept growing because in fact, parallel computing is precisely what's being used to support these 7 billion people. But uh, it started off as a small number. So I didn't see all this huge activity when I did that work. But nowadays, if you do anything in deep learning or cloud computing, the, the commercial companies are addressing it with great vigor because they have to cope with these 7 billion people. Um, and now they're all, because this, these set of um, headlines point out that um, all companies are becoming AI driven companies. It's sort of actually, if you, inter if you look at Microsoft, it used to be a uh, mobile phone driven, it probably was one time a desktop document processing driven company for Microsoft Word, but then it became a mobile phone driven company. Now like Google and Facebook and everything, it's an AI driven company. And Amazon of course, and <coughs> Amazon and Tesla also have major AI and activities. Um, this thing is a, another way of looking at how these things are growing in importance. These are Google trends for various terms. It's sort of interesting that security is so popular. If we have AI, but it's not terribly much changing. It seems to always popular. Whereas if you look at, uh, and actually computer science doesn't change much. But um, artificial intelligence is growing. If I look at a higher, finer scale, and AI is clearly growing nicely. Then we look at components of clouds, Amazon Web Services, Azure, Docker, dominant container technology, Kubernetes, the way you manage multiple containers. These are all growing very fast from, this is 2014 <coughs> to now. Um, <coughs> this uh, slide here points out that we've been worried since the beginning of time I mean, I remember when the Industrial Revolution happened, I don't know whether it did, several hundred years ago, there was a huge eruption that machines were going to replace people. And you've, so we've had this uh, worry for forever. So there's a worry today, will robots replace everybody? There was a worry in 1920 about machines making idle hands. Does machine replace men in the long run, dot, dot, dot. So 200,000 people will lose their jobs to automation, but what happened is jobs changed. So there is true, here we have the locomotive jobs have gone down, the aircraft jobs have gone up, the agricultural jobs have gone down, the service jobs have gone up. So we just changed the job type. And uh, these slides here tell you what you, this is from indeed.com. Unfortunately, Indeed.com stopped, uh, removed access to this information around 2018. So I only have the data up to when they shut it. And it shows how the interest in data science is sitting there. Com core technologies are tr incredibly important. Cloud computing is very important. And this just tells you what the purpose of this class is. You need to become digitally savvy. So you can get those jobs and you can do it whether you're a domain expert, a data science, a data engineer or a software engineer. And no, I think I missed a slide. 
here is a, a slide I, went, I, I missed by mistake. It's saying that um, Gartner trying to uh, take the uh, different types of people. Um, this is for a data oriented team, data science team. It actually had a mix of data scientists, pretty interesting concept of a citizen data scientist, which we would call decision makers, which are domain experts who learn enough data science to be, to be valuable. Data engineering, preparing the data, I told you that was a huge importance. People who are experts on the domain, software engineers, because you have to build systems, geeks and unicorns, which are superstars. And here's some conclusions from this introduction that uh, we have big data, cloud, edge, and deep learning. Clouds are mature, but here to stay. Data intensive or the big data approach is growing in importance. And uh, everything is done as an AI is really optimization. And it tends to use deep learning as its dominant model. There are lots of jobs still in these areas. And uh, these come in uh, all sorts of companies, both the technology company and the companies in the fields like General Electric, which are being revolutionized. So you need to be digitally savvy and you choose which of these various things to focus on. All right, that's it. Thank you. All right, last few minutes. Questions? I will put uh, on the... On the um... uh, Professor, I have a question. Yeah, please ask it. Uh, yeah, so I came across a statement uh, which says that in past two years, um, 90% of the data in the world has got generated. So how true uh, that statement is? I think if I'm right, I came across that day, IBM was the one who... But if you look, I have idea. parts, if you look at the early, <clears throat> this, um, this, I did this last, 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 um, if we look at the plots of data versus time, yeah, we can look at this plot here. Let me share this one. Sorry. When you get the sharply increasing kinds, this is data versus time. It's clear that there's 90% of the data has been generated in the last year or two, or whatever. I mean, it's maybe not the last three years or something. Exactly how many years it takes to get 90% is not certain to me, but it's when these rapidly increasing curves, you will get that type of a scenario. Okay, thank you. As I mentioned, unfortunately, these um, um, some of these plots, like that nice plot of data versus time, they no longer give them because they're <laughs> worried about. Previously, they were trying to convince people this was true. Now their job is all right. People know it's true. We better actually implement it. So they've focused on a different type of second, slightly less fundamental uh, or issues and so it's hard to actually get these nice plots of performance versus time and data versus time which they always used to have them five years ago five to eight years ago the the plots which uh, you showed uh, from meeker um, right so those are pretty interesting plots i mean they give a yeah, very well, good picture uh, okay and that, but those slides were more useful five years ago than they are now because so, at least for this class, they may not be for Jared, for the world. Uh, recent plots are probably the most important. But uh, recently, if you look at them, there are. If you look at our last one, which was must have been 2019, it's 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 actually much larger than the earlier ones. But they're all rather derived quantities. Okay. They don't have these pretty pictures. I remember being so impressed by the number of images versus time, how dramatically that increased due to the smartphone uploading to social media revolution.
they don't do those anymore. Because everybody, because they think people probably correctly know it, but what they don't realize, it would be good to have those pictures because they're very impressive and they help to document why we're doing all of this. So I will post things on the um, announcements saying which websites you should go to to do and which homeworks you should do. And if you have any questions, just do it, ask them on Piazza. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have a quick question. Yeah, it's fine. a very minor one. Um, so you mentioned that data is being created at a far more rapid pace than ever before. Um, current networks, as I understand, it's mostly fairly antiquated hardware. Can that actually handle um, the amount of data we'll be doing in the next? Well, the reason why Cisco is doing, is actually not doing as well as some companies, but it's doing pretty well, is because people are buying better network equipment. I actually have a link to a Cisco report on those slides. Read that report. They mm -hmm. issue it every year and it's a network report. I actually am commented that the report they issue on networking used to have clouds in it. They've stopped putting a cloud report in their network report. But every year they have a network report and they have a recent network report. And it tells you, you know, we have Zeta, we have um, Zeta bytes of data that are correspondingly Zeta bytes of per, per second of uh, Zeta bytes per year transferred on the internet. They have all that information. Okay, okay. Because I, I, read, I read reports from Comcast earlier this year that because of the pandemic and everyone being at home, that networks were stressed because of how many people were streaming data. Of course, yes. I no, there's been a, it, was, it shows actually the networks where underused before because the I was actually quite surprised that when this huge increase due to pandemics happened, mm -hmm. the networks actually did pretty well. There were no drastic outages as far as I remember. So that says, you know, once you put in that optical fiber, it has lots of capacity. <laughs> and, uh, By under usage, I uh, recall one scenario. So in India, uh, during pandemic, they they had announced that we will um, just to appreciate the medical staff who are working in a COVID situation, just to appreciate them, we will you know, switch off all the lights and just lit the candles so that we can, we can uh, appreciate their work. So, I mean, um, the government was afraid that because of less load on the electrical system, there could be outages because the power that we're generating will not you know, get stored in particular station and that the station might, the, the transfer might get burned because of, you know, uh, overload on the system. I see, interesting. Yeah, well, I think the world in that aspect cope quite well with the pandemic. I mean, of course, it didn't cope quite so well with the number of fatalities and infections, both in India and the US, but um, it coped pretty well in the work from home, supporting work, remote work. With remote work being far more common, do you think it's going to increase the amount of data we generate? Or is this like, do you think the trend will become more steep in terms of data generation? Yeah, I think so, yes. Because it's okay. going to accelerate all these trends. Mm -hmm. I mean, remote work is accelerating this digital world. Making well, let's give a trivial example. It's going to enhance telehealth. Well, mm -hmm. how does telehealth work? It has remote devices transmitting information to central repositories. And it just is in encouraging this world where, where you have these um, distributed measuring devices, heart rates, et cetera, and they are transmitting information to the doctor. So it's, so it's going to enhance, the, well, you see, this is sort of the industrial internet of things. It will make the industrial internet of things, which drives both bandwidth and data, bandwidth use and data being data um, production. It will drive those, both of those. Uh, that's actually really cool. Thank you. Yeah, this is um, pretty imp exciting and important. And I say, I think the purpose of this talk is not 
this courses that just make you it's totally aware of what the issues are so you can make the right decisions there are a lot of things to digest <laughs> yes and so, but there are lots of jobs i say there's everything from domain experts which are certainly still needed through the data engineer the data scientist and the software engineer they're all needed to build these systems and we need new materials so we can build solar energy and electric cars and what have you and those so that those new materials are coming from computational studies which are running um running lots of simulations to understand new compounds and then they're deriving neural nets which capture those simulations so they can extend the domain so people have shown you can use deep learning to learn the results of simulations and observations and use it to predict new materials that's been what i read tmmc is actually doing that kind of stuff right now in regards to graphene because um, you mentioned during the presentation that they're doing that they're shrinking the, the CPU dies for current processors. Yeah. So apparently the lowest they can go before they hit quantum tunneling is 1.4 nanometers. Once they pass that, they can't use current systems anymore. That's so that's right. just fast. Uh, people have forecast the end of Moore's law. And they but they for I remember I wrote a book on parallel computing back in 1987, maybe, and I asked, if, uh, this, I was at Caltech in that, a pretty sophisticated university. I asked an expert in applied physics, how long will this Moore's law last? He said, not much longer. <laughs> that was in 1987. He predicted that Moore's law was near the end. Well, he sure made a mistake. I even put his comment, not, I didn't actually attribute it to him, but I actually, when I wrote the book, was a little cautious on the on the future because of that. That's why I asked him. I wanted to know because uh, at that time I realized that Moore's law was driving parallel computing, and that was the purpose of this book. It was a pretty successful book, but um, it um, showed that the ingenuity of humans is, can be underestimated. And it, Moore's it, law didn't uh, hit against the physical limits of silicon. That's right. It's because people say there's a problem, but then people get around this problem. It's again like these plots of jobs. The jobs change. The approach yeah. changes. And so what, that's what's hard to estimate. When you're driven to, to make a faster computer, you just find a new approach. We will see. Okay, I'll see you next week and keep, keep, uh, keep uh, listening for the, for the um, announcements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.